it is so exciting to be here with you to talk about the value of designing strategic conversations and the opportunity that we all have to use our design brain to have conversations that make the world a better place. Just like Bob said, we need generative, collaborative, creative conversations. I believe that is a design practice. So I'm really excited to talk to you about that this morning and share some stories about leaders who are designing different conditions to allow us to imagine better futures. As Jean said, I teach with Nathan at the California College of Arts MBA in Design Strategy. I think of myself as an accidental educator. I find no better joy than helping students envision and become leaders who are designers and to help these designers become leaders. That is my practice. How can these be the same opportunity to shape the world by embracing both modalities of leader as designer? Because as we talked about this morning, the world we're living in is increasingly complex, filled with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The VUCA world that we're hearing so much of, it's almost become, oh yeah, I don't really know what crazy thing is going to happen tomorrow. We're almost not even aware of the massive change going on because we're just living with knees bent, trying to understand what's going to happen next with us. And these designers as leaders, their job is to think of not only how to survive in this world, but also how to think about what's next in this world. How do I actually imagine where we are today and think of what's going to happen tomorrow and create opportunity to bring value to the world, knowing that there's no guarantee of what's going to happen. This is a design skill. This is a leadership skill. So it's really about designing better futures to actually be proactive, to use our maker mind, to think differently about what's ahead. So as Jean said, earlier this year I wrote a book about how to have generative conversations, the practice of design, and actually codifying some of the leadership moments, the choices people make, in order to not allow these conversations to happen to us, but in fact to proactively think of the conditions that's going to bring out the best value in others in order to recombine and create something new. This is in fact a design skill. My favorite definition of design comes from our familiar Nathan Shedroff, who says, it's not my job to design something beautiful. It's my job as a designer to make choices that trigger the right responses. And so the question is, what responses do we want to trigger? And what we now know is that as a craft, as a skill, we know how to design beautiful products that not only deliver great functionality, but also delight us in ways that we thought unimaginable. I love Josh's comment this morning. We now have less unintentional, ugly things. I think we can go even beyond that to say we become rabid fans of these well-designed objects, things like the Dyson vacuum or the Herman Miller sail chair or the Nest Collective. How many people here have a Nest thermostat? How many people love their thermostat? Can you ever imagine loving your thermostat? Because that is the power of great design. And what we've learned is that this design is actually a craft that can be learned and mastered. It's not a crapshoot. It's not magic that we have these products and skills that delight us. There was actually time and attention, those 10,000 hours, and the discipline of actually bringing something new to the world that didn't exist, that delivers this utility and engages us emotionally in ways that we love. Can we imagine that? about our futures, how do we actually design better futures? And I agree with Bob, it starts with better conversations. Those conversations do not have to be a crapshoot, they can be designed. Our role as a designer is not just to design better products and services, it's actually to design better conditions that engage opportunity to reimagine the future. So how do we do that? Do we do it here? Is this where we design better futures in that little piece of white space we have on Monday between 10 and 11, right? This is the reality of the tension that we live in, where we have great desire and hope to make the world a better place, but our schedules and our calendars are killing us. Our corporations, our organizations are not allowing us to use our designer brain. They're squeezing us in. And we half the times we don't even know why we're invited to these meetings, but we show up. And the great creative time is left to the 11 p.m. time at night when you're so exhausted, that's when you get to have your white space to actually think. So this is not allowing us to be the designer and the leader that we want to be. We sit in rooms that look like this, trying to be generative, trying to have that conversation that's going to lead to the breakthrough idea, and our brain is actually feeling this. I got to get out of here. I cannot be creative in this condition. This is killing me. Right then, 
we actually get so frustrated, we start to self-help under the table because I have real work to get done. And they've sequestered me and I'm not using my best talent, so I'm just gonna get my work done anyway because otherwise I'm gonna be up until midnight and I'm gonna be angry. This is a real epidemic. This is not allowing us to have the conversation we need to because we're having the groundhog conversation. Didn't I just have this conversation? We were just here last week, what happened? How am I back here again? Self-help begins again. Harvard Business Review recently published a really horrifying study on the lost cost of these conversations and these meetings. And in fact, this is the chart they call ripple effects. And what they showed is they looked at one fairly large organization and realized that the weekly communication, the weekly meeting at the executive level in the center led to 300,000 hours of prep time and meeting before the meeting and the prep meeting and then the meeting you had with your departments in order to talk about what was deciding at, decided at that executive communication meeting. So this is a real epidemic. I mean, we are losing thousands of hours to, ha to be sitting in that room that creates no value for us whatsoever. What a blind spot. We've been talking about blind spots. This is a big blind spot. This is huge opportunity for us to take a look at. Tony Schwartz earlier this year had a cover story in the New York Times, a piece that said, why you hate work? And essentially says the same thing, that we want to bring our creative selves to work. We want to feel valued for our potential, but our work design does not allow us to do that. We are bombarded with emails and responsibilities that don't feel like they really tap into our best potential. And as a result, we come back deflated feeling unenergized and hard to figure out how to actually design that better future. This is the gap, this is an opportunity for us. We need to create opportunities, conditions for creative and collaborative conversations. This is what we call moments of impact. The ability to accelerate change because we were felt and heard, our ideas resonated with others, we aligned and we can carry them forward. This is a craft, not a crapshoot. You can learn this. You can do this. This is what we spend our time doing. And in fact, we were so committed to it in our book, we created a 60-page starter kit at the back. So even if you don't want to read a single page, jump to the cliff notes in the back, and you can start to have better conversations. We can do this. We are not triggering the right responses. So that is where you come in, the designers, to think broadly about designing conditions in your organization beyond just bringing something new of a product and service, but really allowing your colleagues to come together to together create something of value that didn't exist before. So I want to share some stories, practical stories of leaders who have designed these moments of impact. And my hope is by hearing these stories, you can identify an opportunity for you to go back and design a moment of impact by making a different choice, by triggering a different response. So the first principle I want to talk about is this notion of moments of impact are really about discovery. It's about when we feel that collective sense of new ideas and insights that we both see at the same time. And it often doesn't come from sharing a compelling data-driven chart. It comes from when we've experienced something immersively in a different kind of way. And this mode of discovery is a very different kind of leadership style. It's not about the Superman, superhero, of this other world kind of magic power based on expertise and execution, where the person with the best idea wins or the greatest resume wins. In fact, this is about creating conditions instead of discovery and experimentation. So I think the new model of hero is not that superpower with the strong muscles, but is in fact the person that takes their ruthless curiosity and goes forward to try and understand something of a mystery that they didn't know before and they go out and they look for evidence and they have a hypothesis and they find evidence and then they recreate uh, their hypothesis based on what they found. It's really about being Nancy Drew. So I wanna introduce you to one of my favorite Nancy Drews who you will get the pleasure of listening to later today. So think of this as a precursor introduction. So meet Karin Hansen. Karin, at the time that we talked to Karin about the book, was the VP of Design and Innovation at Intuit. And in 2010, she was asked by Brad Smith to think differently about the future of mobile. How do we design a better future around the future of mobile? And because Karin has a fundamental view of Nancy Drew, she has this philosophy of you have to fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So how do I create conditions of discovery to get this executive team to fall in love with the problem, not the solution? So she took the top 15 members of the executive team to a beautiful resort in Half Moon Bay. You've all been to these off-sites where you're either taken to somewhere beautiful. And typically, you have the same conversation you would have had 
in that boring boardroom, but instead you just have it somewhere beautiful, thinking that like access to the you know wine and the scenery is going to somehow make you more creative. Karin knew that it wasn't about presenting the hockey stick charts of growth of mobile, but instead she had to get the executive team fully immersed in the power of these devices that were coming out in 2010. So first thing she did was she brought in small and medium-sized customers, their typical customer base, to understand how they were using their mobile devices to run their businesses. Very different than buying the shrink wrap software from retail stores. They were using these devices to build everything. These were becoming the new platform. So typically, the more senior you get, the less conversation you have with customers. This was very eye-opening. But then she did something really brave. She said, OK, this afternoon, we are all going to experience the power of mobile. And what she did was she divided the teams into uh, the, the uh, executive group into teams, sent them to the town of Half Moon Bay, took away their Blackberries, gave them all iPhones and Androids, and told them that for them to come back that evening, they had to create essentially the amazing race of mobile. So they had to use these devices to check in on Foursquare, uh, write a review on Yelp, do a foreign translation. Essentially, she wanted them to feel the power of mobile, of just how advanced these devices were to try and see that the future was actually already here. She said what happened was amazing. They got into the spirit of competition, and they came back, and they realized that they needed to invest. And what she did was she created a very different conversation where if she just stayed in that room and talked about one issue after another, if you think about the issues against the vertical line of emotional engagement, it would have just been a flat line. But instead, she asked them to experience it themselves. And in doing that, created a different kind of emotional connection where they had insights about what they were excited about and what were opportunities that they were nervous about. And it was through those insights that they got to an aligned point of view that mobile was something that they needed to work on immediately or they were going to miss it. And Intuit is one of the companies that can be looked at as really uh, making a very quick turnaround of investment to say, we have got to pivot from being a software in a box to being a mobile first company. And it was because that Karin created those conditions of discovery where they got to feel themselves, where they moved beyond, as Josh said this morning, the territory protection zone and into the future zone of aligning around this opportunity that they needed to work on together. Because in discovery, questions are more valuable than answers. And she created a safe place where it was OK to question. It was OK to say, what are we going to do in order to be a player in that? So we have to focus on conditions of discovery, not conditions of telling. That's the first thing. The second key to creating moments of impact is actually to intentionally promote extreme collaboration. So I don't know about you all, but I know that typically when I'm asked to join a cross-functional team, it sort of feels something like this. I invited you here today, not because the topic is relevant, because I really didn't want you to feel left out. Does anyone feel part of those? And essentially, these cross Disciplinary teams end up looking something like the Noah's Ark. OK, we've got two from product, and two from marketing, and two from compliance, and two from legal, two from engineering. Did we miss anybody? And we think, let's create. Right? That is not the way we create conditions of cross-pollination and collaboration. In fact, we need to think more like lessons of improv. Um, and this is a picture of my students. The very first day, we practice improv so that we learn how to be a good team member. And one of the fundamental principles of improv is not to be brilliant, not to try and be witty or funny or say the best thing that wows the audience. The number one key to improv is to set your partner up for success, is to offer something that allows them to build on it and then you build on it, to be present and to allow something totally new to emerge because you've showed up ready to give your best contribution. You're not looking for one-upsmen. You're not worried about how you feel or judging if it's right or wrong. Everything is right in improv. And when we're trying to bring something new to the world, we have to remember that our job is to support our collaborators and allowing them to feel that they can bring something new to the table. And together, we're going to come up with a new combination. So let me share another story of bringing this to life. I want to introduce you to another wonderful designer leader, Neil Grimmer. Neil Grimmer is a sculptor by training, also Stanford uh, product design background. And he was the chief innovative officer for Cliff Bar. And something important happened to Neil. He became a dad. So when you're a dad and you're experiencing things for the first time, you celebrate these milestones, like when your baby starts to have solid food for the first time. So he went to the supermarket to buy some new food for his baby who was finally graduating to oatmeal. And he looked at the shelves, and it looked like this. And he thought, gosh, 
why is this so depressing to buy baby food? I could not be more excited, and I'm buying beige food in a jar that looks like it's from 1940? Like, could there be no more imagination for babies? So he decided to start a new kind of baby company, and it called Plum Organics, and the idea was to reimagine what baby food could look like, to actually create flavors that we wanted to take in, like purple carrots or beets, and not to just go for yellow and beige foods that were bland and tasteless. And he created packaging that was fun to buy and fun to give to your child. And he created an infant line that allowed for dexterity, for kids to play with autonomy, to learn how to open up the package themselves. And in spite of starting just before the economic fallout, by 2011, Project had $38 million in sales, which for a new retail consumer packaged good company is like crazy town. So clearly the market was reacting to the fact that this was something of value to them. And so Neil had a board meeting to talk about designing a better future, to talk about what's next for them. And he, because growth is a good thing, right? We've got lots to talk about. But Neil did something very different in order to promote conditions of extreme collaboration. Instead of just having his board come together and talk at them about all the projected growth, instead he put them to work. And when they walked in, they saw this. Welcome to the baby food fight, battle of the baby brands. And he said, for the next hour, we are going to take on our competition to figure out in the hearts and minds how they would crush our company. So you are going to be the CEO of Earth's Best, and you will be the CEO of Happy Baby, and you are going to be the CEO of of, um, uh, another company, and you are going to go out to the world for one hour to research how you would kill our company and what we should do in response. He said what happened was unbelievable. I mean, board members are not used to working, are they? No. So he said they asked for more time. They were on the phone. They were trying to understand what was happening in the baby market. They all came back with presentations. One group had another group in the corner, and they were working on a joint venture to kill their company and a private label. He said it was unbelievable what happened. They all had these very vibrant ways and elaborate strategies of how they would kill our company. He said they came up with these storylines like, Big Gorilla Gerber's gonna crush our baby plum, or uh, we're gonna have a happy baby chicken fight, and you know, this is gonna be battle, battle to the death of the baby brands. And what they did was they came back together and they plotted all these ideas on a two by two to figure out where they stand in order to figure out what they needed in the future. Although they couldn't share it with us at the time, within a year there was an announcement that Campbell's bought Plum Organics in a very strategic, uh, very beneficial deal for everybody involved. In fact, I think one of the Plum Organics co-founders has retired for the time being, based in part by the generosity of this deal. Um, Recently, I was at the supermarket, which was interesting, and I looked at the baby aisles and I found this, and I don't know if you could see in the back, but that front kiosk is actually Gerber, who has completely copied Plum Organics design and look and feel. So I recently saw Neil, I said, are you getting ready for Baby Food Fight 2.0? He's like, don't you know it. We are working on it. So, uh, you know, and it was also interesting to talk to Neil about how he has to create different kinds of conditions now that he's part of a larger company. So he's already using his design mind to create more conditions of extreme collaboration, even in the context of a larger company. So we've got to create conditions of discovery. We've got to promote extreme collaboration, set our partners up for success. The third thing that I think designers are uniquely qualified to do is actually to frame the problem, to take the time to say what problem are we trying to solve. So often we just go in and solve the question that was most recently asked, not taking the time to say, is this really the right problem we need to solve? Typically, when you're bringing something new, what we found was that there were only three big categories for the kinds of conversations that you need to have. You're either building understanding about what the opportunity is and why you need to be having a new conversation about bringing something new to the world and what success looks like, or you're shaping options. So from that understanding, you're actually diverging and coming up with many possibilities, or you're making decisions. And what tends to happen, and one of the reasons why our conversations are so ineffective, is that we think we can do all three in once. We cannot. Our brains are not wired for that. This is a series of divergence and convergence. And your job as a designer is to make sure you're communicating what kind of conversation this is. Because if you don't, you're having one conversation and your colleague is having another conversation, you might as well not even have that conversation. You have got to make those conditions clear. Let me give you a great example of this. 
which comes from a classic movie called Moneyball, a great book by Michael Lewis. There's a scene in the movie and in the book where they were talking about how does a baseball organization like the Oakland A's that has far less resources than pretty much every other organization in the National Baseball League, how do they compete when their best players were taken by richer teams that were able to recruit them for a lot of money? So, by the way, I just wanted, I thought this was an appropriate story to tell because, of course, this is the moment in time where I become a baseball fan. So just in case you're all wondering, tomorrow night you should be cheering for the Giants, uh, one and one. It's a really important game. So uh, it's a good story to tell at this moment. Uh, sorry that the Yankees are not in. So there's this great scene it, where they're trying to figure out what do they do once they have their two best players taken and they don't have the resources in order to recruit new players. How do they go about it? And there's this great scene where all of the scouts are talking about the potential replacement players that they can get. And Billy Bean, who's the general manager of the Oakland A's, is sitting there and he says, what problem are you trying to solve? And these guys, these are the scouts, are saying, well, we got to find a first baseman and we got to find an outfielder and we got to do it with no money. And Billy Bean keeps saying, what problem are we trying to solve? And they say, we're trying to follow, find replace, replacement players. And finally, Billy Bean says, we are not trying to solve uh, the problem of trying to find replacement players. We are trying to solve the problem of winning games. How do we win games when we have so many less resources than the other teams out there? And because he took the time to ask that question, we are trying to solve the problem of winning games. He was able to look at the problem in an entirely different way using data analytics to realize that baseball games are not won by star players in certain positions. Baseball games are won when you have more hits than the other teams, more runs stolen by the other teams, uh, more opportunities to get on base. So he was able to use stats to find a way to get players that were significantly undervalued by other members of the, national, of the, of the baseball league and was very successful. And it's disrupted the way that managers think about staffing their baseball teams. So what problem are we trying to solve? The last one I want to talk about is the importance of actually using these conversations to design cultures of hope. If you have these conversations that feel generative and engaging, they change the way you work outside of those moments. It can literally change cultures that look internally and are focused on protecting territory to looking more expansively about the future. That is the power of these kinds of conversations. So I want to leave you with one final story of Eric Burmeister, who is a principal at a local middle school near where I live in Menlo Park. He is a beloved principal, was already the national finalist for Obama and the White House about principal of the year, and finds himself as an unexpected designer and creator of hope. So Eric Burmeister came to Hillview a couple years ago. It was a beautiful new campus, and he really saw an opportunity to change the way we think about public school education. And he purposely came in and joined Hillview because he saw an opportunity not just to solve problems, but actually to reimagine the best possibilities of this school. And one of the things he did was he purposely went to the superintendent and said, I believe we have a chance to redefine how students are uh, respected and are appreciated in our school, but it's going to take understanding the students from their perspective, not just from the administration perspectives. So he created conditions of discovery, and the very first thing he did was he recruited a design team, a multidisciplinary volunteer team of teachers, tenure teachers, new teachers, parent volunteers, outside members of the community who just wanted to see a better middle school supporting their community. And when they came together for the first time, he just had these words on the board, welcome designers, because he wanted them to see themselves as creators. This wasn't about status. This was about best contribution. And he had them go out and actually shadow middle school students from the day they got, the moment they got on campus, 7.30 till 3.30. Because he said, you know, we sit in all these board meeting conversations, all these faculty conversations. Nobody asks what's going on with the student. Why don't we experience that firsthand? And they took their ideas and they actually created new possibilities of what the school could look like given the insights of the students. And he then um, really thought about how are we framing success for these kids, not class by class, but their full development. 
And he learned two really important things from this experience. The first thing he learned was that the student schedules just felt crunched. And although schedules were like solidly in constraint land of, oh, you don't touch the schedules, union, no, you know, danger, he said, that's crazy. These students need time to decompress before they start their afternoons, before they start their second job of all the afternoon activities. So I don't care that I'm going to have to bust unions. I don't care that we're going to have to change the sacred schedule. We are creating block schedules and opportunity for kids to decompress. That was number one. The second thing he did, which was really extraordinary, is that he learned that students wanted more autonomy and choice. And uh, within eight months, he created, I think, one of the most interesting experiments in public school education. He created a week-long deep dive program for all 975 students to go off-site and actually choose an elective of their choice, anything from all about Alfred Hitchcock, crafting the novel, creating a documentary, architecture, redesigning Menlo Park, all of these things for them to express who they were, and he called it school, only different. And he uh, organized a hundreds of volunteers in order to support this. And it was just an amazing demonstration of really redesigning what school could look like. So just extraordinary opportunity. So I thought I'd end by um, not just telling you what he did, but um, you can hear for yourself about what Eric did. Serve, right? So, um, <clears throat> When I came to Menlo Park, everybody in the city wanted to tell me what they thought needed to change about Hillview, right? Um, and uh, as soon as like the Almanac article came out, you know that this guy's coming, it was like I'd get emails and you know I'd get stopped and say, oh, you know, let me tell you about what you know in 1972 this happened to my kid, and could you do something about it? Um, and I was like, oh, sure, we'll totally fix that. Um, uh, and um, but what was really interesting about it was people were really energized and they wanted to be creative and they were excited about having somebody who had a history or, or, or a um, reputation for change. And um, when, when I came on, our new superintendent who had only been here for a year, who's very interested in design and creativity and innovation, um, uh, had created a partnership with the design school at Stanford. So we were going there to find out how design could influence the classroom, right? And we're sitting there and I'm like, yeah, this is all cool stuff and yeah, our kids would love to do design and you know, so on and so forth. But, I could use design to change the school. Like here I am, the new principal, in the middle of this innovative town of innovators, and people are hungry for change, and they want to see change, and my superintendent's supporting me, and they asked me to, to, to come here, so you know maybe I should take a risk and sort of be creative and take a design approach to how we're going to change our school. So I approached our superintendent, and I said, so I know you want us to do some design in the classroom, and I think that's really cool, and we're going to get there. But what do you think if we used design principles to actually ask the community what kind of school they would want if there were no constraints involved? And he was like, I love it. And that's the moment I knew I had come to the right place. And so we got a design team together, and we all got trained on the design process, and we dove in head first. And, uh, and the result, I mean, you know, I've only been in the community now for about a year and three quarters, and what's happening at Hillview is truly remarkable. And it's not about me. Um, it's, it's really about opening up the floodgates to creativity and innovation and focusing on who we're trying to serve here, which is the students. Right, just incredible. To me, I think Principal Burmeister really emulates this new model of leader as designer and designer as leader. And by doing that, he has able, he's been able to do what I call the, the yeah buts, the sort of three obstacles to what makes this hard, this focus on near-term results, right? He said, yeah, we're not just focused on the classroom, we're focused on changing the conditions of our school long-term. Moving beyond the politics in play, that territory and turf protection, and the capability gaps of understanding that most teachers, most parents don't understand design, so he created a whole parent ed series to get parents on board with this experimental new way of thinking about education, allowing him to create a sustainable, adaptive culture of hope. Uh, going back to, to Karen, she says, you know, if you're sitting in a room with a lot of slide decks, there's very little that can go wrong. There's also very little that can go right too. So I think it's incumbent upon us as designers to kind of turn up the heat a little, to take some risks, to really get in there and create different kinds of experiences and conversations that really push the boundaries of what's possible. Because I think when we do this, we instead turn those yeah buts and those obstacles into conditions of hope. 
right? This is a, the opportunity for us to think longer term, to build skills and capabilities while we're experimenting, to do the real work in our practice of every day, and to rally around a common purpose. Because as John Maida said, and I think seeing a president of an art school move to Silicon Valley to become a design partner at one of the most important venture capital firms is a sign Yet one more sign of design's influence on the future of founders as designers. And he said, design is still a human skill that even now Google cannot automate. There is no Moore's law equivalent of design. The only way we are going to scale design is if we scale ourselves, if we scale our human potential and really take it out of perhaps the jobs that we're asked to do and really try and use it to model a new kind of leadership with our colleagues by taking risks to have these different kinds of conversations. So I encourage you to uh, have more human conversations. The more human the conversation, the more human the response. And we end the chapter with a call to action, which is to make your moment. This is your opportunity to make different choices that trigger different responses. And this is a picture of Eric, who made a promise to a group of students who were underperforming. And he said, if you rise to the, to the challenge, if you push yourselves and actually believe that you can do more than you think you can do and achieve a certain kind of, of outcomes, I will let you shave my head in front of the entire school. So here is a picture of Eric, true to his word, creating conditions of hope and possibility, shaving his head in front of the entire school. So I believe that this is the power of design to create a better future. So thank you very much.